Hello everyone, welcome to another Conan Exiles castle building guide. I'm Beeman and today I'll show you how I've built my version of Helm's Deep from the Lord of the Rings. Well, technically Helm's Deep is the gorge while the keep guarding its entrance is called Hornberg, but everyone I know calls it Helm's Deep anyway. I have to admit that I was very reluctant to publish this. It is an in-game recreation of a movie set based on a fantasy novel. It's far removed from reality. Making a movie set based on a castle means compromising a lot of its defensive features, or sometimes the whole design. Then replicating it in game as a usable base brings some new issues to the table. But I decided to go with it because of the unique challenge this design presents. In the movie the castle is basically just the curtain walls and entrance. Everything important is underground. Ok, let's start building. In my immersive base building guide I mentioned two different methods of building, shell and inside out. I'll be using the latter for a significant portion of this skip. I know I want to make a fake gate leading into the mountain and it will be a starting point for the whole castle. I've anchored a foundation block on the cliff face where the gate will be, then built more foundations below to reach the ground and blocked out the shape of the main keep. I know the 2D requirements, a 5x13 rectangle, and I'm casting it on the ground below, the foundations following the slope. The land is very uneven here, and normally I'd let the walls follow it, but I'm constrained by the movie's portrayal of the keep. Its carton walls are the same height all around, so I'll have to find a perfect height which will make the wall stay above ground on the upper part of the hill, and not unreasonably tall on the lower. Still, this difference in the relative height of walls and baileys gives the castle a significant volume, which I can use. Now that I have some area to work with, I can start fitting the map room and altar here. I took a quick glance to see how they fit the shape, and then started to box in the space they require. This is a simple process. Find the lowest possible floor with enough area, while making sure that the ceiling stays well below the ground floor of the baileys. The first block I've placed in this entire castle is the ground level for the keep, and I know the heights of all the walls and baileys in relation to it. So I know what's the final height of each column of blocks, and therefore how much space I can use underneath. Of course it's way easier to use a visual guide, so once I had area big enough for the map room and altar, I've built the walls to the proper height. Also, one thing to keep in mind for this kind of constructions is to either have a perfect plan for all the upper levels to make sure that there is enough stability for the roofs, or simply don't be greedy and use the minimal amount of space then fill the rest with foundations. The second option allows for some flexibility and last minute design changes if the original layout of the upper parts of the castle doesn't look as good as you want. I want to be safe, so I'm using only enough space to fit everything I wanted here then fill the rest with columns and foundations. Some of the tiles I'll be using throughout this build may look unfamiliar to you. I'm playing on PC with quite a few mods installed, so check the description for my full mod list. Most of the stuff I'll be using in this video comes from a single mod though, glass constructions and more. This mod adds a lot of cool building blocks to the game and greatly expands the Black Eyes tile set. If you can't use mods you can still follow this guide, but you'll have to improvise. For example, place a regular pillars here or maybe use foundations. Later on for the arches you might use inverted sloping walls, and working match collations can be done with hatches. I've done all of that in my previous videos, so check them out if you have a minute or two to spare. The results are not as nice as this, but they definitely look good enough. So the map room and temple are done, and I still have plenty of space left to make another room under the main floor. I've chosen this exact spot for a very specific reason. The place where I started building is protruding a bit from the cliff, so this leaves a tiny bit of space to the sides where I can build a staircase on one side and an elevator on the other. Of course there is a small mistake in the video, I forgot to actually leave the space for the elevator shaft, but that will be rectified soon. When placing foundations by the hundreds it's kinda easy to get into this mind numbing rhythm of click and move and forget about leaving space for important stuff. And yeah, I did not count, but this place will really require a couple thousand foundations. It's actually one more reason why I was hesitating to make this video. 
This is not something you can just casually build outside of admin mode. The amount of materials required would be insane. The staircase is off to the side for a very specific reason. I have a cunning plan to hide my entire home from unwelcome visitors. Also, this building in the movie is just an entrance containing a reinforced gate that leads into the mountain, and I'd like to preserve that image. Part of cinema's magic is the utter lack of dimensional coherence. After all, a door shown in one scene, shot on location, may lead to interior built in a studio on the other side of the world. The same is true for many games. Often interacting with a door triggers loading screen and moves the player to separate world space. In simple builders like Conan Exiles this is not possible, so I need to create the illusion of entering the mountain while all the rooms are actually stacked on top of each other. My second objective is to keep it hidden, so that it still resembles the castle as seen in the movie. One thing that immediately raises suspicion is the geometric complexity of a room. A simple rectangular chamber where everything is visible at a first glance is simply boring. Therefore, people give it a quick look and move on. A very complex room with many nooks and crannies may be confusing, but invites exploration. So, for that reason, I've decided to make the grand entrance a simple rectangle, with the five arches on the front, just like in the movie, even though they make no sense at all. This is the gatehouse protecting the way into the underground parts of the fortress, and it is literally the opposite of fortified. Like I said earlier, I have chosen my location very precisely. The cliff forms a wedge pointing to the middle of the gate. This combined with the fact that the door always open away from the player makes it really hard to notice the side door that actually leads to the staircase. In this instance, the fact that this is a recreation of a movie set actually works in my favor. It provides a reasonable explanation for a huge gate that opens to a cliff face and alleviates suspicion. Also, once opened, the gate completely hides the little side door. I know I could simply place the door on the other wall, making it easily accessible, but where's the fun in that? To make it even harder to discover my secret entrance, I've made sure to exploit one more trick. Shape consistency. Basically, it means that the outer shape of the building closely matches the interior. In this case, the only fully accessible room is rectangular, just like the whole building. This tricks the brain to naturally conclude that the building has no internal divisions, and the external and internal walls are the same. The chamber above the entrance will be my respawn point, and I'd love to have easy access to the map room, which is on the deepest level of the keep. So instead of making the staircase go down there, I can use the space on the other side of the gate and build elevator connecting the top and lowest floor. Of course, I got overzealous placing foundations earlier, so now I have to destroy a couple to make the elevator shaft. The rotation of the elevator is important here. Activators used to call it are always placed on opposite sides. In the movie, the entrance is almost flush with the cliff. I obviously couldn't do that here, so I've ended up with somewhat large roof that I need to incorporate into the castle. Simplest choice is to turn it into another fighting platform. This will require roof access, which is not a problem as the existing staircase can be extended, and battlements. I've decided to make simple match collations, with no visible arches and corbels supporting them to maintain flat, almost featureless facade of the building to keep it closer to the original look. Also, this creates a nice superposed order. The lower part of the facade is dominated by arches, while the top is made of straight lines and right angles. The inner bailey is divided into two tiers, the upper protected by the tiny wall. This is purely artistic decision by the designers of the movie set, as this has no value as defensive feature. The proper way would be to replace four arches with solid walls, create narrow tunnel between the middle arch and inner gate, and turn it into kill zone by placing numerous murder holes above it and arrow loops to the sides. Now it's time to expand the base. This is pretty simple for this design. I'm going to add more square foundations to the side of the original rectangular base. Two rows for the lower tier of the inner bailey, two more for the inner wall, then four rows for outer bailey and two for outer wall. Then it's simply a matter of mirroring this arrangement on the other side of the castle 
and filling up the front with wedge foundations until all the elements, that is baileys and walls, reach their proper width on the remaining sides. Honestly, this sounds way more complicated than it actually is. Due to the steepness of the hill, a lot of useful space can still be squeezed out of this. So if you want, for example, an industrial complex with dozens of furnaces and blacksmiths, you can absolutely do that. I'll put Animal Pen and Wheel of Pain here, just as an example. This area can easily be connected to the map room, but I want to give you more options, so I'm going to build another elevator, and this time attach it to the outside of the main keep's entrance. On one hand, this makes it visible and obvious, but on the other, it adds at least some detail and complexity to the building. You decide which option you prefer. Now it's time to bring both walls to their proper height and start adding details. Gatehouses, a little bridge linking inner bailey with outer wall, and battlements. Hornberg, as seen in the movie, is basically a concentric castle. Its designers have chosen to keep some of its core features, like one-sided battlements, but decided to omit others. There are several features which render the castle useless. One of the major issues is incorrect wall height. Designers decided to make all the walls almost the same height, which greatly compromises the inner layers of the fences. Also, the gate is in the open, there is no barbican, no double gate, nothing. Even the gatehouse is extremely reduced. Combined with the fact that there is nice flat area in front of the castle that's just perfect for deploying siege machines, well, the outer gate's useless. And that huge ramp literally begs for a drawbridge. Even though this may sound as if my opinion of the castle and its designers is quite low, that is not the case. This is simply a matter of different perspectives and different goals. Like I said in the beginning, this is not a realistic castle, this is a movie set. And as such it was meant to inspire a certain emotional response in the viewer. And with this in mind, the walls suddenly make sense. The monolithic and featureless shape of the castle invokes the feelings of confidence and strength. It's a rock upon which the tide of enemy shall break, and the rough, primitive even, battlements also fit the theme well, as it's supposed to be an ancient fortress. Look, guys designing this stuff for movies aren't stupid. They just have different priorities, and often, a lot of constraints which aren't obvious to the viewer. Now, I also have some goals and constraints that guide me in my efforts to recreate this in-game. This will, as always, lead to a compromise, hopefully a satisfactory one. So for starters I'm changing the gatehouse. I'm reinforcing it slightly and I'm placing the gate much deeper inside the walls, so that it's at least a little bit protected and there's a tiny choke point in front of it, which will be exploited by murder holes in the gatehouse above. In order to keep similar silhouette to the one in the movie, I'm only adding a single tier of blocks. The whole thing will be barely taller than the surrounding walls. Outer carton walls on this side ended up ridiculously tall and flat, so I desperately need to somehow make them less dull. For that reason I'm employing ornate machicolations and I've actually moved the whole gate to the side. In the movie it's almost in line with the keep's entrance in the inner bailey. Here I've shifted it a bit so that the ramp will draw attention away from the huge flat wall behind it. Also, I wanted to improve the castle defensiveness at least a little bit by making the enemy circle the whole outer bailey once they bridge the outer gate. One thing I have to always keep in mind that movie set designers can skip is the internal traffic. Basically, in the movies, castles have two states, they are either secure or breached. In contrast, my castle can be fully explored by the player and there is no screenplay to adhere to so I had to carefully plan the location of access points for each line of defenses. I've decided to fully exploit the concentric design of this castle and turn the whole outer bailey into a kill zone. So, the outer wall will only be accessible from the inner bailey via the little bridge, as this is the tallest part of the wall, therefore most secure. The wall becomes a lot lower as it circles the inner core of the castle, so naturally enemies might try climbing it there. In that event, the gatehouse can still defend the access to the bridge for a while. On the other side of the castle, another set of gates will connect both baileys. 
The uneven terrain rises above the outer Baelish level, which allows me to break the established floor pattern and create the staircase leading to the inner gate and back door. The outer wall also ends here, seamlessly integrated into the tower. The tile pattern for the tower is easy. Two squares and three wedges for the outer circle, then one square and three wedges, followed by alternating squares and wedges, and finally a core of six wedge foundations. The tiny bit of space left behind the tower is just perfect for the back door. Now I can be wrong, but I don't think it was shown in the movie. Its existence was strongly implied though by the visible path climbing around the outer walls of the castle, and this would also explain why breaching the dipping wall was so important. The problem is, I can't really know if the filmmakers wanted a tiny sally port or a proper gate here. Logic would dictate a full-sized properly built gate. Hornberg and Dipping Wall completely seal off the gorge, and since there is no gate in the Dipping Wall, all traffic heading for Aglaron or the Glittering Caves at the gorge's far end must enter the castle via main gate, pass through the outer bailey, and exit through the postern gate, but the narrow and steep path leading to it that's shown in the movie seems to contradict this and rather suggest a small hidden sally port. Well, like I said, Making a movie set you'll need to paint a pretty picture, not bother with logistics. Speaking of pretty things, and pretty useless things, right next to the back door is the tower. It's only significant in a single scene where Gimli climbs up its spiral stairs to sound a horn that's mounted on top. Why is that important? Lore reasons, I guess? The design of the tower is, well, less than practical to put it mildly. There is not a single fighting platform, parapet or battlement, not that it would matter a lot as it's located in the back, behind the dipping wall anyway. So basically it's pointless, a waste of money and effort, after all it's a huge part of the castle and has no practical defensive value. It looks nice though, the roughly carved structure looks and feels ancient, stoic and powerful and it works well for a movie. After all, it's just an inconsequential part of the background. Looking in a certain way is its only goal. I'm going for a compromise. Most of the tower will be useless, just like in the movie. But I'm adding a single tier of battlements on the lower part, which will overlook the approach to the rear gate. This is also in stark contrast to Tolkien's original vision. He actually made a drawing of Helm's Deep and his version is a decent sized, perfectly viable castle. For starters, it's not attached to the side of the valley, rather there's a spur protruding from the side of the gorge's mouth upon which the castle is built. Then there's the river, which flows along the base of the spur, creating a natural moat. The castle itself has a symmetrical concentric design, with two baileys and the tower, or rather a tower house, serves as its citadel. There's a problem though. If you watched the movies, you probably know another concentric circular castle with tower in the middle, the Isengard. This actually makes a lot of sense as both Isengard and Hornberg were ancient fortresses built to guard the gap between Misty and White Mountains. They were both constructed during the Second Age by the same people, so it's no wonder they share similar designs. There's one unbreakable rule when it comes to making good movies though. Do not confuse the audience. In plain words, it means that good guys need a visually distinctive castle that's nothing like the bad guy's fortress. Truth is, movies are not made for hardcore fans who could easily tell the difference. They are made for broader audience. For many, the movie might be a first contact with a given franchise, so it must be easily palatable. So a lot gets changed, and a lot of details get lost in the process, but in the end, they are not that important. After all, Mother of Dragons raised three wyverns, Netflix Witcher has human eyes, and somehow the world didn't end. What I'm trying to say is that a movie needs relatable heroes, despicable villains, memorable locations, and first and foremost a great story. Once it has that, it doesn't matter how many legs a dragon has, or what's the shape of some dude's pupils. This is something that's completely missing from the movie, the inner gate. This is also the moment where I should start ranting about the filmmaker's complete ignorance of European medieval fortifications 
and utter disregard for realistic portrayal of siege warfare, but I won't. Instead, let's consider the audience again. The average moviegoer know exactly nothing about medieval castle design and siege tactics. Chances are they never even seen a proper castle. So, instead of introducing concepts like layers of defense, kill zones, etc., filmmakers have to create easily recognizable singular events which clearly show what's going on. Also, they have to keep proper pace of events and maintain tension and suspense. Basically, forget the castle, there's a story to tell here. And as long as it's a great story, all those sacrifices and compromises are worth it. Or, if you catastrophically fail and throw it all away for the wrong reasons, you'll end up with Siege of Winterfell or King's Landing. Anyway, let's move on to, well, another controversial element of this castle. The great ramp leading to the main gate is the only thing I really dislike about the original Tolkien's design. The spur and the river protect the castle from three sides. Why compromise it by building a ramp instead of placing the entrance on the only viable approach path on the other side? Just like every single spare castle ever built did. One thing I need to clarify here. Spare is just a terrain feature and even though there is a castle design tailored to exploit it, there is nothing preventing other designs from being built on one. Though some may seem a bit redundant. It was done in real life too. Crack the Chevalier is a concentric castle that's located on a spur. Anyway, Tolkien's design has some merit, as there was another line of defense in front of the castle that the movie completely omits, but the gate is still quite exposed once enemies cross it. On the other hand, ramp placement is crucial for the epic last stand of heroes, when they actually charge the whole uruk High army. Sure, seems kinda strange that they had horses ready and waiting in the underground Great Hall, but, well, like I said, compromises and sacrifices. In a way, I'm actually glad that this ramp is here. It allows me to draw attention away from this huge, flat, boring wall behind it. Anyway, with that done, the last thing to build is the dipping wall. The book describes it as 20 feet tall and wide enough so that four men can walk on it, next to each other. The face of the wall is flat, with an overhang on top. Not the best design. On flat area, a tolls and moat of any kind would be great to deter siege towers. I am going to assume that overhang means simple machiculations, otherwise it just wouldn't make any sense. Last time I've shown you how I decorated the concentric castle, and I've said that there's one item in the solar that's out of place but provides meaning to other things in the castle. It is the dagger on the table. Specifically, it's the Fang of the Serpent, from Conan the Barbarian movie, a dagger given to neophytes of Tulsa Doom's set worshippers sect to kill their parents with. So it's an easter egg, but also consider the table with maps and scrolls. The Lord held a council with his advisors there, deciding on the course of action, and then there's the knight receiving blessing for the journey ahead in the temple. Is quest linked to the dagger in some way, perhaps? Like I said, a simple thing, but it hints that there's a story to tell there. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you haven't done so, consider subscribing so that you won't miss the next one. Cheers!